You ready, Ashley and John? Yes. Good evening and welcome. My name is Trent Sendelar. I'm with the St. Louis Public Library. Thank you for joining us for the second of three spring lectures of the 2023 Society of Architectural Historians, St. Louis Chapter, and St. Louis Public Library Stedman Architectural Library Lecture Series. On behalf of the St. Louis Public Library, Stedman Architectural Library, we are pleased to continue our collaboration with the Society of Architectural Historians, St. Louis Chapter, and host this lecture series. Before we begin, we ask that you please mute your devices. Should you have any questions, please type them in into the Q&A section. If time allows, after the talk tonight, we'll pose your question to Esley Hamilton. And now, I'd like to introduce John Gunther, FAIA Lead AP and Architect, who serves as President of the Society of Architectural Historians St. Louis Chapter. He will introduce our speaker for this evening's talk. John? Thank you, Trent, for your welcome and for hosting this talk. Please know how appreciative we are to the St. Louis Public Library, Stedman Architectural Library, for our continued collaboration for our lecture series. It is my privilege to introduce our friend and colleague and tonight's speaker, Esley Hamilton, Honorary AIA and Past Preservation Historian, St. Louis County Parks. Historian, preservationist, critic, the answer man, irreplaceable, tenacious, a force to be reckoned with, a bridge between the profession and the public, a library on feet, and a St. Louis treasure, are but a few of the ways people have described Esley Hamilton. Simply put, Esley Hamilton is the most knowledgeable and admired figure in historic preservation in St. Louis and well beyond. For 40 years, he served as preservation historian for the St. Louis County Parks and Recreation Department. He retired as preservation historian after cataloging more than 4,000 county buildings and adding 300 properties and eight historic districts to the National Register of Historic Places. In 2014, S.A. Hamilton was one of four professionals to be honored in Washington, D.C. at the Secretary of the Interior Historic Preservation Awards Ceremony, winning in the Certified Local Government category. In 2013, Esley Hamilton was one of five nationally to be selected as an honorary member recipient of the American Institute of Architects. He is also an honorary member of AIA St. Louis and a recipient of the President's Award of the Landmarks Association of St. Louis. In 2009, the University of Missouri St. Louis granted him the honorary degree of Doctor of Arts and Letters. In 2005, Missouri Governor Matt Blunt gave him the Rosier Award, the state's highest preservation honor. Esley is also a trustee of the National Association of Olmstead Parks and editor and contributing author of the newsletter of the Society of Architectural Historians, St. Louis chapter. He generously shares his encyclopedic knowledge of architectural history here and abroad through countless speeches, writing and good counsel. Tonight, Esley will talk about the architecture of Dublin, Ireland. The Republic of Ireland was considered one of the poorest countries in Europe until a generation ago. Since then, however, the nation has experienced exceptional economic growth and with it, a renewed flourishing of the arts, including architecture. Esley Hamilton had an opportunity to witness some of this last summer and was inspired to learn more. His talk this evening takes a new look at the compact and friendly capital city of Dublin and finds not only many notable modern buildings, but a rich history of progressive planning and building going back to the 18th century. And now, please welcome Esley Hamilton as he presents the architecture of Dublin, Ireland. Esley. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, how do I, am I uh, being seen just with my image now, uh, uh, the, uh, my title screen, or does it have these other uh, screens, other? You're, you're sharing time, we see your image. Everything's looking good, Leslie. Okay, good. All right, well, um, the, uh, one of my friends said she was shocked to see this picture because it looks so modern. And parts of Dublin actually do look very modern, although other parts, uh, are well preserved from the 18th century. Um, to continue with a little bit of the history that we were talking about, 
Um, I have three maps here. The one on the left shows the 32 counties of Ireland and uh, including the six at the north that are still part of the United Kingdom. Uh, the others are the Republic of Ireland. The middle map shows uh, the way the uh, country looked in the Middle Ages. Uh, it, the uh, city of Dublin was founded by the Gales in about the eighth century. And uh, the Vikings who were uh, settling uh, Iceland and other parts of the North during this period, Normandy, for example, uh, really turned Dublin into a major city and major port. And in these maps, you can see that uh, the area around Dub Dublin is really the only a good port area on the whole east side of the country. There are quite a few good ports on the south. On the west end, you have cliffs and severe storms, so that's not good either. But um, uh, so Dublin was a natural place for a large city to grow up. In the Middle Ages, though, uh, starting about a century after the Normans invaded. Uh, England in 1066, about uh, 1170s, they invaded Ireland uh, from the South Shore, and they succeeded in taking over large ports, parts of the South, but only one small area in the North. And then the area around Dublin, which was really the only area that was under the direct rulership of the king in the uh, army of, uh, of England, and that was known as the Pale. And when you got beyond the Pale, as the expression goes, uh, anything was possible. Uh, and it wasn't until the time of Queen Elizabeth and uh, uh, around 1600, uh, when James I uh, took uh, the throne of England, that uh, the English were really able to control the whole island. Uh, the third map shows the four provinces of Ireland, and even today, this is a common way of referring to the different parts of the country. Uh, Leinster was the pale, and that has the most uh, uh, properties that are connected with British settlement. Uh, Munster in the south, as I mentioned, was the ports. Uh, Ulster in the north was settled by mainly by Scots in the 1600s, and uh, they were Protestant, and that created this gulf between those six counties and the rest of the nation that we still deal with today. And Connacht was the poorest part uh, because it was the roughest and stoniest. And also uh, during the English uh, Civil War, Oliver Cromwell moved a lot of gales into Connacht and away from the Pale. Uh, so they, they were the people with the fewest resources also. So all these things are important to know when you're, when you're looking at the history of the country. Uh, this drawing on the left uh, shows the way that town looked in the Middle Ages, and it would have been very small. Uh, the port was really created by the mouth of the River Liffey, and it was uh, very low lying and marshy. But there was one big hill that was about two miles from the mouth of the river. And that's where the town was settled. And in this drawing, you can see, I think I can show my uh, cursor here. The castle was at the southeast corner of this uh, high ground. And then the church, Christ Church Cathedral, was right in the center. And to the north, the ground dropped rather steeply to the river. So over the centuries, the river gradually was more and more confined to keys or uh, 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 barriers that controlled the water and kept it from flooding. But even uh, in the 1600s, there were, it was a very small place. Uh, the wall around the original city still survives in certain parts, and only one of the medieval parish churches is still uh, in part standing. And in these two views, one from the 50s and one from uh, recently, uh, you can see that tower, St. Audience Church. Uh, 
And uh, the, notice that the crenellations at the top are kind of uh, triangulated in the corners. And that's one of the characteristic features of Irish medieval architecture. Uh, here we are up on the hill looking at uh, St. Audien's Tower. The present tower dates from the 1600s. And the east end of the church was uh, from the 15, uh, 15th century, 1482. But uh, as the number of Protestants uh, shrank in Ireland, uh, they couldn't afford to maintain the whole church. So they took the roof off the, the uh choir in the small side chapel, and uh, just the arcade is left there today. In the right-hand picture, you can see there's another very large church behind St. Audience. That's the Catholic church, which was built in the 1840s after the Catholics regained their uh, political rights uh, in, in uh, the United Kingdom. Um, it, Dublin is unusual in having two cathedrals. Uh, this is Christ Church Cathedral, the amid, uh, original medieval church. And then down the hill to the south is St. Patrick's, which marks a site where uh, St. Patrick, the uh, apostle of Christianity to the Irish, is said to have lived. And today, St. Patrick serves as a national uh, monument, and uh, Christ Church is the, the cathedral for the uh, uh, Leinster area. Um, both of the churches were largely rebuilt in the Victorian era, and uh, it's now difficult to distinguish which parts of them are uh, uh, medieval and which parts are from the 19th century. But fortunately, Christ Church was redesigned by one of the best Gothic revival architects working in England at the time, uh, Edward G. Street, who also designed the the uh, the uh, judicial center on the Strand in London, uh, and he this all this renovation was paid for by a distiller. We always think of uh, Ireland and Dublin, especially in connection with Guinness and stout or ale, but uh, they had a long tradition of uh, spirits also. And Henry Rowe put so much money into this restoration that he almost went bankrupt. Uh, the, the picture on the right shows the, the choir screen, which is an example of Street's uh, original work. Um, the front of the church is not really accessible to pedestrians because this bridge is going from the west front of the church across the road to another building which was originally uh, designed as a synod house uh, for church meetings. This is be, would be what we would say uh, were maybe Presbyterians, but uh, Irish Protestants. It's called the Church of Ireland. Um, and today that's an important museum uh, showing artifacts of the Gaelic and, uh, and uh, Viking eras. Uh, this is a view of, uh, of the other cathedral, St. Patrick's, uh, from the south side, as it looked in the 18th century before the renovations were done. Uh, you can see that it's rather plain. Uh, and this is the way it looks now uh, from the north side of it. And this beautiful garden was a gift of Benjamin Lee Guinness, who was the son of the founder of Guinness Breweries. And he acted as the benefactor for this restoration. And uh, the church is considerably larger in length than uh, Christ Church. Uh, and the, uh, the cupola or the spire on the tower was originally added in the uh, as it says here in 1749. Uh, so it, it was not a medieval feature, but it probably was planned. And it's true of many churches in Ireland that they were never completed the way they were intended to be. Uh, the greatest feature of 
Uh, St. Patrick's, though, is this floor, which is uh, tile. It's called Minton tile, but all, all the patterns actually come from archaeological examples uh, of real medieval floors that probably wouldn't have had such bright colors. Uh, still pretty impressive. The, there are almost no houses left in in Dublin from the early centuries of its existence. And even from the 17th century, there are very few. Uh, the typical house uh, in the, uh, that was being built in the 1600s was uh, based on Dutch row houses. And the pair in the center is a very good example. Uh, and uh, then you have simpler examples at the top. But over the years, all of these were either uh, demolished and replaced, or they were remodeled so they looked more like Georgian houses. And in this slide on the left side, you see a pair of houses that had the, the uh, Dutch gable replaced by an additional story. So you have the odd feature of two windows on the third floor, but three on the fourth floor. And uh, you find these even in very sophisticated, uh, some of the more wealthy streets of the city, but very rarely do you find uh, an original one and they're usually in back alleys and places like that. But there is one that you can see at the bottom of this slide. Um, as the city grew uh, in the late 17th century, they built a canal that went the whole way across the island from the west to the east. And it was called the Grand Canal. And it created a boundary on the south side of Dublin. And in this uh, fairly recent uh, map, you can see that blue line still there. And it still has a beautiful pedestrian walkway along it. And it's lined with trees. And I would say practically every movie I've ever seen that's set in Dublin has at least one scene showing the people walking along that path. Um, later in the early 19th century, they added a complementary canal on the north side uh, of the city, which you see here, and that connected with uh, trains, which were now beginning to take over. And the red line that runs through the city is the very modern uh, it's called Lewis, L-U-A-S, which is a streetcar system, uh, which really connects with uh, all the bus system and makes most of the metropolitan area uh, accessible. Um, the first important civic building built in Dublin, uh, at least the one that's still standing, is the Royal Hospital at Kilmainham, which is on the east side of the city. And in this aerial view, you can see the uh, river, the Liffey, on the right, going into the distance to the west. Uh, this was not actually a hospital, but a retirement home for soldiers and sailors who were serving in the, uh, the British forces. And it, it's complementary to the two similar hospitals that were being built a few years later in, in London. Uh, the, Chelsea Hospital, which is just west of downtown London, and then uh, the uh, Greenwich Hospital, which is uh, to the east. Uh, Greenwich was the sailor's uh, retirement home and, and Chelsea was the soldiers. Greenwich was so huge that it's been used for many things since then. But uh, this continued to be an a soldier's home until recently, and now it's uh, uh, the a contemporary art museum. <laughs> uh, the art, the architect here, Sir William Robinson, had a practice in London, and so his standards were very high. And they set the standard for a whole series of public buildings that were built throughout the 18th and early 19th centuries in Dublin, often earlier than uh, comparable buildings were being built in uh, London. And that's, uh, that's one of the great things about uh, the city of Dublin. Uh, here's the uh, inner courtyard and you can see this uh, face that we're looking here is very similar to one of the colleges in 
Oxford or Cambridge, in that the center part of it is split between a hall, a meeting hall or dining hall, and a chapel. And here's the way the chapel looks today with no pews, but a magnificent plaster ceiling, very much like uh, the buildings that Christopher Wren was designing at the same time in London. And also on the right, notice the wainscoting, which is also carved three-dimensionally with these beautiful uh, swags and uh, swirls of uh, foliage. Uh, so after the uh, Kilmainham was built, there were two other hospitals built right in the same area on the west side of the city. Uh, one was Dr. Stevens uh, Hospital, and uh, it was started in 1719. And I had to show you this railing on the left, which I presume is 19th century, but the, it's being held in place against the wall by these iron hands. And today, this is the uh, Parks National Park Service and other historic preservation offices for the national government of Ireland. Uh, and just up the hill from St. Uh, Dr. Stevens is St. Patrick's Hospital, which was actually a bequest uh, set up in the will of Jonathan Swift, the famous writer, who was also the dean of St. Patrick's Cathedral for most of his life. And uh, this is the memorial to him in St. Patrick's on the left. Uh, you'll notice, though, that the larger name here is the name of the person who gave the money for the uh, memorial at the bottom under the plinth is the word swift. But at the bottom is some writing that he actually left uh, in addition to his will, explaining his intentions here. He gave the little wealth he had to build a house for fools and mad and showed by one satiric touch, no nation wanted it so much. And you can see the design is very similar to uh, a Palladian house would be in uh, in England at the same time. Uh, at the, in the middle of the century, the first uh, hospital specifically for uh, pregnant women was built in Dublin. Uh, this is before any comparable uh, institution in England. It was originally called the Lying In Hospital, but it became known as the Rotunda Hospital because to the right of the main building was a series of uh, uh, amusement buildings that were intended to be leased out to raise money for the hospital. And it was also built at the south end of one of the five squares of London, of Dublin rather, uh, uh, which is now called Parnell Square, uh, which had charged admission uh, and had beautiful uh, flowers and other uh, events, special events there. Here's a drawing of it showing it in the 19th century. And it still is pretty much intact, uh, which is so unusual with hospitals. But the most important room in it is the chapel right over the entrance. And you can see the stained glass windows in the slide on the left. On the right, you can also see that it's decorated with some very elaborate plaster work uh, by uh, John Enzer, I think, and Bartholomew Cramillon, who was a Frenchman. And uh, this set a standard for plasterwork decoration, which was followed throughout the 18th and early 19th century in most of the exclusive houses in Dublin. And that's it, still considered one of the great art treasures of Ireland. Uh, here's the uh, a detail of some, the figures on the cornice line, which which represent uh, faith, hope, and charity. Hope is always shown with the uh, uh, anchor and uh, faith you see is uh, blinded. Uh, let's see. Here's a closer view of the, uh, the rotunda, which is now a uh, movie theater, the ambassador, and the uh, assembly room, the kind of, uh, Georgian looking building behind the rotunda uh, was added in the 1780s uh, as an assembly room, very similar to the assembly rooms that you see in York and Bath in England. And today that's the Gate Theater, which is one of the two most important theaters in uh, uh, Irish literature. 
and it's still active today. The castle, which we saw was already being built uh, in uh, the Middle Ages. It was actually founded by King John, who died in 1216, um, but it was largely rebuilt in uh, the 18th century uh, piecemeal fashion. The uh, different wings were named after the different viceroys who served here. Uh, the big one with the tower is the Bedford Tower, which would have been uh, the Russell family, the Dukes of Bedford uh, from the 1750s. And, uh, and then on the other side, the, this was the state reception rooms and also served as the residence for the, uh, the, the viceroy. He, he also had a country house right outside of the city in what is now the main city park, Phoenix Park. And that house is now the home of the president of the, uh, of the Republic who serves a more or less uh, symbolic purpose uh, rather than the prime minister who actually runs the government. Um, here's the biggest room in the uh, castle is St. Patrick's Hall, which uh, at one time was the home of uh, a knighthood order like the Order of the Garter, the Order of St. Patrick. But after the independence of the country, it uh, they stopped awarding that uh, title, but these flags represent the flags of the men who were the last members of the Order of St. Patrick. Uh, the chapel, well, the tower here is really the only major part of the, the castle that survives. And I think it was kept because it was a stronghold for the money, uh, the safest part of the, the building complex. But the, ca the uh, chapel, was added in 1814 and by a man that we'll hear his name uh, quite a few times uh, later in this talk, Francis Johnston, who was really the last of the great Georgian architects uh, who worked in uh, Dublin. Uh, but it's also, this particular building is one of the first and most uh, successful Gothic revival churches. Um, and this is the interior, which is pretty spectacular, especially the balcony carvings and the very unusual uh, plaster work uh, vaulting pattern. Uh, and this is the back of the castle. Uh, this lawn here was originally called the Black uh, Port, which was where in Gaelic the name uh, Dublin comes from. Uh, in uh, in 1728, a young architect named Edward Lovett Pierce was commissioned to design a parliament house uh, for Ireland. Ireland had its own uh, uh, House of Lords and House of Commons up until 1800 when uh, the, uh, the United Kingdom was formed. The, the name UK that we use today only dates to the final uh, merger of the Irish Parliament with uh, the British, the English Parliament, the Irish, the Scottish Parliament had been merged in 1707. And of course, many historians think this was the most disastrous thing that ever happened to Ireland, the loss of their self-government. Uh, but this was the first Parliament building anywhere uh, it, uh, for the whole nation to be finished. Uh, remember, uh, the United States one was only founded, uh, only started construction in the 1790s. Um, and uh, this is the way it uh, still looks, uh, although today it's completely surrounded by buses most of the time. Here's the plan as it was originally. And you can see the center uh, meeting place for the commons is an octagon. And then to the right of that, the long building, a long space that looks a little bit like a basilica plan was where the lords met. There were very few lords until the 19th century. And then at that point, they had very little power. This is a painting from 1780 of the way the House of Lords looked. And I think it's so crowded because one of the most famous orators, uh, Henry uh, um, Keane was supposed to be speaking that day. Uh, the, 
uh, it was where many important things happened, but unfortunately it burned in 1796 and they never got around to replacing it before the uh, merger. And uh, at that point, the complex was taken over by the Bank of Ireland. This is the House of Lords, a section drawing showing the way it was vaulted and apsed. And the drawing in the center is a huge tapestry showing William of Orange uh, defeating the Catholics in the Great Battle in 1791. And you would think that that would have been taken down after independence, but it wasn't. And it's still there today, um, a little bit the worse for wear. Uh, and this gives you an idea. This is a still a pretty impressive Roman inspired space. Uh, because the parliament was growing, additions were added to the building in the 1780s. And the one on the right, the House of Lords edition, was uh, designed by James Gandon, an architect who had uh, worked with uh, uh, Chambers, the one of the leading architects in London. And uh, the one on the left for the Lords was done by a local architect, Edward Park. Um, they wanted to keep these additions uh, with the same cornice line as the original building, but the ground was dropping to the right. So that meant that the portico, the spectacular Corinthian portico is much larger than the others in the building because it, it goes down farther. And of course, the classical proportions must be preserved. Uh, and all the practically all the traffic in Dublin goes past this portico now. So it's very well known to the public. The other uh, side of the building, though, is kind of in an alley now, uh, but it's a very beautiful ionic uh, portico also. And then uh, when the bank took over, they hired Francis Johnston, whom I mentioned earlier, and he created an entirely new space. Uh, which you see here, this was called the cash office. And this is still functioning as a bank today. Uh, Gandon is, was for many years, the only Irish architect whose name was recorded in architectural history books. And this is a very good painting of uh, him showing him working on one of his buildings. Uh, and he had the good fortune to be commissioned to design a whole series of major buildings. Uh, this is the uh, the four courts building, which was uh, the high highest courts in this in the country, um, and they were arranged uh, in diagonals, the four spaces around this central dome, and right on the banks of the Liffey on the north side of the river. And here's what that. Uh, looks like today. The two large uh, do uh, double doors on the sides are the entrances to two of the four courts. There was a building in St. Louis in the 19th century called the Four Courts, but uh, Andrew uh, Ramis told me that there were really only four, three courts in the building. And so it was called this just because uh, this was such a famous name. Unfortunately, like many buildings in Dublin, it was gutted by fire during uh, either the uh, rebellion of 1916 or during the uh, uh, revolution that went from 1919 to 1921, or the following year, there was a full scale civil war. Um, and uh, the building was fairly well restored after the fire, but the building, the room on the left, which was the library uh, is was totally lost. And this is one of the big losses to people studying the history of Ireland today, the contents of that room. Um, the other big building was an even more impressive, I think, was the customs house. This is closer to the mouth of the river and the river is wider at this point. And this enormous length of building really dominates this part of the city. Um, and uh, even, this is the side, the north side toward the rest of the town. Uh, it was pretty impressive too. And then Gandon also designed 
semicircular row of houses uh, closing the square that this colonnade uh, faces onto. Uh, there's only five of those houses left today, but the space is still there. And here's what happened uh, in, uh, I have the date here, May of 1921, uh, that I show the fire truck here on the left because one of the things that people subsequently reported is that the fire uh, companies showed up, but they didn't do anything to stop the fire because they were all on the side of the independence movement. Um, and so lots of, uh, of records were lost here too. For example, the Wills room was in the basement and that was the first room they uh, fired because they knew that fire would spread through the whole building then. So they lost all their early Wills. Um, in uh, in 1769, the, uh, a businessman in Dublin built this magnificent building as the Royal Exchange. And this corresponded to the Royal Exchange in the center part of London. Uh, but at the time it was somewhat more grand than that one was, which was rebuilt in the 19th century. And this is on the main business street of the city. In the 1850s, it was sold to the city and the city uses it as their official city hall. It's a great place for weddings. You can see in this section drawing, this whole center part of it is one huge space, uh, but it didn't have much office. Uh, space. And that became an issue in the 20th century, which I'll come back to. It, uh, one of the strange things about the building being situated on a hill is that there are very few places where you can see the dome, but Parliament Street, which comes up from the river, is the best place to see it on the left. And this is what the interior looks like, with taken with a very wide angle lens. Uh, and you can see the chairs set up for a wedding there. Uh, at the other end of uh, Dame Street the, that we were just looking at, uh, down at the foot of the hill was the campus of uh, Trinity College, which is at right angles to the Parliament House. You can see the two original wings of the portico on the left, and another representation of William III in this equestrian statue. Uh, this was founded in the 1790s by Queen Elizabeth, and it was really intended to be a rival to Oxford and Cambridge. It's much smaller, but it still is very highly ranked in terms of uh, European universities. And the whole campus was rebuilt in the 18th century by some of the best architects of the time. Uh, for, this is the inside of the uh, room, the building we were just looking at. And the two wings uh, on the right, you see the chapel and on the left, the corner of the so-called exam room were both designed by William Chambers, who was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a Gandon's teacher and also a close personal friend of George III uh, and considered to be the foremost architect in England at the time. And we'll look at a few of his other designs uh, it, for Dublin also. Here are the two interiors, the chapel on the left and the uh, uh, exam room on the right, which probably originally was intended to be a dining hall, but they built a separate dining hall with a much larger kitchen uh, right after that. So this, is more a ceremonial room. Um, in addition to the great buildings at Trinity, uh, the Royal Barracks, um, which is now called Collins Barracks, was started in the early 18th century. And it was the first uh, residential buildings for soldiers in the British Empire. Up to this point, the uh, soldiers had either lived in the basement of the palaces or they had been put up with the citizens. And you remember that in the uh, US Declaration of Independence uh, that's con considered uh, listed as one of the uh, infringes on uh, the liberty of Americans that uh, they would have to put up with these soldiers in their houses. Um, the I believe the present appearance of this complex is 
from it being rebuilt in the middle of the 18th century. Um, and it, this is what we're looking at here is just about a quarter of the original size of the barracks here, which, which extended uh, pretty far down the river. Uh, and today, this is the branch of the National Museum that deals with uh, what they would call early modern history and uh, arts, uh, and decorative arts. There's also a fantastic uh, geology uh, division here. And this building is so large that they're years away from ever occupying the whole thing with their, uh, with their collections. The last important building that James Gandon designed was the Four Courts. Uh, I'm sorry, was the uh, uh, was the King's Inns. The King's Inns were uh, like the uh, inner uh, uh, temple and middle temple and uh, Lincoln's Inn in London that were residences and offices for lawyers who were serving in the uh, national court system. Uh, and this was built on the hill above the Four Courts building. And originally this facade would have looked into a a large square, which would have had houses around it, all occupied by lawyers. But that part was never completed. But the, the part that was completed is quite beautiful. And uh, now this part is a, a park, which is open to the public. Um, and here are some of the interiors. Uh, Gandon's dining hall in particular is one of his great works. Uh, and this is the side toward the town, uh, which has this great screen that was designed later by uh, Francis Johnston, um, whose name keeps coming up. And originally one of the wings of the building was uh, for the library, but the, it got so large that they had to build a completely separate building, which you see here on the left, and that is still functioning today. Uh, farther down the street, this is called Henrietta Street, and this was the first real row of uh, aristocratic houses in Dublin. And one of the odd things about it is that they're attached uh, houses, uh, even some of the wealthiest people in the city and the archbishop all had houses here. Um, and uh, they were the street was laid out by Luke Gardner, whose family owned much of the land on the hill top on the north side of the city, uh, but uh, who didn't actually build too many of these houses. For the most part, he sold the land, but he had very detailed restrictions on what could be built there. Um, and one of the things you'll notice is that the houses have no cornices except for one. And it looks, uh, if you are not familiar with that, it looks like the cornice fell off and killed somebody and the city made them tear all the cornices off the buildings, but they were never actually there, uh, which makes these uh, rows quite a bit different from ones that you see in England. And also the uh, great variety uh, we're familiar mostly with Dublin houses that have large fan lights over the door, but you can see in this view uh, that there were several other different door designs originally. Uh, and the most spectacular one is this one, which is based on a drawing by James Gibbs. Uh, and these two pictures show the same door, but taken when the door was painted different colors, you, <laughs> the, you could see the outside is dark blue and the inside is uh, pale blue. But this gives you an idea of how detailed the interiors were, just the opposite of the very uh, austere exteriors of most of these buildings. On the uh, northeast side of the city, uh, following the success of Henrietta Street, uh, Luke Gardner designed Mount Joy Square, which you see here. And eventually his family uh, was named uh, Viscounts Mount Joy. Uh, and that title, I think, persisted into the early 19th century. Um, this photograph that you see here is actually a plan for the restoration of the square because uh, after the uh, unification in 1800, the north side of Dublin 
kind of lost its cachet and uh, people moved to the South side or they moved back to London. And uh, by the later 19th century, most of North Dublin was uh, very poor. And instead of having one family living in these row houses, they would have 20 families, each with a separate a room or sometimes not even a whole room separating them. Um, and so by the 1960s, quite a few of these houses have been torn down. But today it's all back together and with some very beautiful new newer buildings that match perfectly. This is a view of the north side of the square. And here again, you can see the differences from one house to the other. Although the proportions of the ceilings are pretty much the same. The highest ceilings were on the floor above the entrance because that's where you had the most unobstructed floor space uh, for entertaining. Then the uh, main bedrooms would be on what we would call the third floor and the servants and children on the top floor. And uh, these railings here are an important feature because actually the ground floor is below the level of the street here and it's fully open to the uh, to the uh, air uh, behind those railings. And that's where the kitchen is and often there's uh, servants rooms and other family rooms down there. Uh, by building the squares at the tops of hills, they had declining uh, ground on all sides and that made it easier to have these uh, partially uh, below ground uh, ground floor levels. And here are three different designs for uh, for how uh, for um, doors uh, in these squares. One of the reasons for the fan lights was that some of the entrance halls didn't have any other light. So that was very important to have that. Uh, but you can see that while some of the, the these three doors have side lights, the red one doesn't. Uh, on the north side, there was one new church built for the Protestants, St. George's, which is really the only church in Dublin that rivals the great churches of London, like uh, uh, St. Martin's in the Fields is the most famous one. And you can see that uh, here it was on axis with Hardwick Street. Uh, and most of the important buildings following uh, these two uh, were designed in that way too, to, to magnify their impact on the vistas of the streets. Unfortunately, this entire street was demolished for public housing in the 1950s. Um, and part of this, the cross street in front of the church was also. This was the street that Leopold Bloom lived on, the one in the right-hand picture. But that house has been destroyed also. In this view, you're looking at the south side of Dublin and the, um, the uh, square in front of you is St. Stephen's Green, which was not actually built as a residential park, but was leftover land from St. Stephen's leper uh, hospital that went back to the Middle Ages here. And uh, the, the, there still is a hospital on the site of the original leper hospital, but uh, this was uh, a few blocks away. And so it was, um, gradually landscaped in the early 1700s. And then a whole series of very large uh, row houses were built around it, some of which have survived. In the distance on the left, you see Marion Square, which was part of the Fitzwilliam estate. Uh, and that was the family that, uh, that developed this side of the river uh, more than any other. And eventually, Actually, the Fitzwilliam properties were descended to the Earl of Pembroke, who's still one of the uh, most uh, senior aristocrats uh, in the British nobility. Uh, and so his big house outside Salisbury, Wilton House, is partly supported with rents from, uh, from Dublin. Uh, and then the last of the major squares is the one on the upper right, which is Fitzwilliam Square. And that was the first one where they were able to limit the through streets 
there are only two through streets in Fitzwilliam Square, so it's much more secluded than the others, which tended to have major roads going past them. Uh, this is Marion Square, uh, and uh, of one of the doors, beautiful ionic capitals. Uh, and this is the north side of Marion Square. The Fitzwilliams owned a granite quarry not far from Dublin, and they gave a discount to the people who were building houses on their square to encourage them to use granite as their foundations. And then you can see in this case, most of the uh, first floor uh, has granite also. You can also see here how different the, uh, the house designs are from one to the other. Um, another great example of an uh, axial placement of a public building, this is St. Stephen's Church on Upper Mount Street, which is runs right off of, of a Marion Square. This was called the uh, pepper canister because the shape of the spire and Fitzwilliam Square here. And this view on the left gives you a good idea of the, the area way, as they call it, the below ground part of the house. Now, the, there were very few freestanding houses in Dublin, and they were all very important. And the, the first one was built long before the others. It was actually built by Dawson to uh, uh, encourage the city to buy it for their, for their mayor. And so it still is called the Mansion House ever since 1715. There is a Mansion House in downtown uh, London also in the city, but it wasn't built till years after this. So this as far as known, this is the oldest uh, official mayor's residence of any British uh, uh, city. And uh, because it was used for so many public events, there were additions added to it. And the most important one was this strange looking uh, feature here at the end of this little side street, the uh, the round room, they call it. And in this view, it looks like it's very small, but here's what it looked like when the first meeting of the Independent Parliament of Ireland took place in 1921. And you can see it's a very large and impressive building. Uh, another important freestanding building was the Provost's House at Trinity. And I don't understand the word provost, but I think that uh, in this case, the provost must have been more important than anybody who might have been called chancellor, because this is one of the great houses of Ireland. And in this drawing uh, on the left, that is actually showing the home of General Wade in London that was designed by the Earl of Burlington on a street that went uh, north of Burlington House, which is still standing uh, off Piccadilly. Uh, and so this is a really remarkable survival of this uh, Palladian architecture based on a drawing by Palladio for a house he built in uh, Vicenza. This is the reception room upstairs uh, in this. And I love this picture because it shows you how much work went into the decoration of these rooms. Uh, the plaster work is just stunning, and even the repetitive moldings are uh, are not plain by any means. Uh, I mentioned uh, uh, chambers early earlier, and uh, chambers designed two important buildings for the uh, James Caulfield, who later became Earl of Charlemont, and his townhouse, which faces uh, Parnell Square and the back of the Rotunda Hospital is uh, here. And today it's the city museum, art museum, uh, which is called the Hugh Lane after um, an important art collector who went down on the Lusitania during World War I. Um, and it was the first collection of Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings in either England or Ireland, and part of it is, can still be seen here. Here's on the left is the original entrance hall, and on the right is the 
uh, newer 1920 uh, edition for the uh, museum. And Charlemont had a country house that was just a couple of miles northeast of uh, central Dublin uh, uh, called Marino. And uh, it had a kind of plain brick house there, but he designed this uh, secondary residence on the property, which is known as the Casino at Marino. And uh, if you look at it from a distance, it looks like it probably has one room in it, but it actually has a complete suite of residential spaces on two floors. And uh, the detailing uh, spares no expense. The picture on the right here is looking at the ceiling of one of the porticos leading into the casino. And here are two of the rooms which have recently been restored to their original color schemes. Uh, these two colors seem to clash, but the a light blue uh, is actually a color that was very popular in the 1780s and has been restored in other uh, houses of this period. Uh, and let me show you these two pictures that show you the detailing that went into the carving of all the neoclassical moldings. Um, another uh, uh, landowner who was a great, uh, had a great interest in architecture was Lord Powers Court. His country house, which was south of Dublin, was uh, uh, the largest one and most expensive one in the Dublin area, and it burned in the 1960s. But just uh, in the last 20 years, the shell of it has been restored, and some of the rooms in it have been restored too. But this, as you can see, is an extremely large house with a two uh, uh, annexes. And in the back, the uh, stable yard is still standing also. And this whole thing has been turned into a, a, a shopping area with offices in the front. And the some of the original detailing of the interior is quite impressive too. The, the balusters here are uh, mahogany. And uh, when you go up the stairs, this shows you the Rococo plaster work that uh, kind of swathes the whole interior. Um, and uh, it's known that some of these plaster workers came here from Italy, but there were also Frenchmen and uh, native Irish. And this one was uh, James McCullough, who was a native Irishman. Uh, this little house is at the south end of St. Stephen's Green, and it's so small because it was only about a mile from uh, the owner's uh, other residence, and so he didn't really need a separate room. Uh, Clan, uh, Earl Clan William, uh, this was uh, designed by the same architect as the Rotunda, uh, Richard Castle. Um, he was probably from the German city of Kassel, K-A-S-S-E-L. And in the time that he worked in Ireland, he was called C-A-S-S-E-L, C-A-S-S-E-L-S, or just plain C-A-S-T-L-E, Castle. So it's difficult to trace him because he went by so many different names, but this is one of his masterworks. Uh, and uh, keep in mind, that with the reception rooms on the second floor, the stairway was always an important part of the uh, processional sequence. This is the uh, main saloon, as they called it, on the second floor with uh, spectacular plaster work of many different patterns. And then this is one of the side rooms, which was probably used for card playing. And this is called the Apollo room uh, from the figure of Apollo over the fireplace. And the, uh, the seven, uh, 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 no, the nine amuses that are in the panels along the sides of the walls. Uh, right next to, uh, Clan William House is Newman House, which is named after uh, John Henry Newman, who became a, a Catholic. He started out as a uh, Episcopal bishop and uh, ended up as a Catholic cardinal. And he founded the Catholic University of Dublin, which is 
the largest university in Dublin today with a very large suburban uh, campus. But originally, the four buildings that you see here, including the little church entrance on the right, were the whole campus. And gradually, uh, they spread out and, uh, and then uh, moved in the 1960s. Uh, we'll come back to see the chapel uh, later. But this is the entrance to the original huge Newman house from the 1780s. This is the staircase plaster work. And this is the blue room, which is off to one side. Um, another important Catholic institution was Belvedere House, which was founded as a boys school by the Jesuit order. Although the house had been built for somebody else, but they moved in there shortly afterward. And it has some of the most beautiful plaster work, although I don't think this dark blue is the original color. But here are two of the saloons, and you can see the goddess Diana at the right uh, with her moon crescent behind her and the deer uh, pulling the carriage. But on the left, you have this abstract pattern. This was the, uh, the uh, Venus room. And that was too much for the Jesuits to take. So they took down the central roundel and put this uh, abstract design in. Uh, the, beginning with those, you can see that gradual influence of the neoclassical movement that eventually replaced the Rococo uh, wild uh, free designs with more uh, uh, archeologically correct Roman and Greek patterns. This house, was for Lord Kenmare and today it's accessible as the James Joyce Center, uh, which has wonderful collections, but they've also restored all the 18th century decoration. Uh, the staircase here has at least three different shades of green uh, in different parts of the architecture. And this uh, room here with uh, garlands of ivy and uh, my favorite is the Royal uh, Academy of Music. Uh, there are quite a few uh, scholarly institutions in Dublin that still have royal in the name, even though they are located in a republic now. But uh, this house uh, uh, from 1771 has uh, uh, decorations that you might have seen in a house in London by Robert Adam. Uh, particularly the ceiling on the right. And uh, on the left, you see one part of the fireplace mantle. The biggest house by far in the, in the country was uh, the home of the Duke of Leinster, who also had a huge mansion only about 16 miles outside of Dublin uh, called Carton. He was the only Duke in the Irish uh, nobility uh, and owned probably more land than any of the others. And uh, this house is often said to have inspired the design of the White House. One of the reasons for that is the alternating round and pedimented uh, designs over the main windows. Uh, but there are other houses uh, in Dublin that have that feature also. This is the main lobby. And uh, in 1815, this became the home of the Royal Society of Dublin, which was a very important cultural institution and is still active today. Uh, but in 1921, it was taken over as the Parliament Building. And the Great Hall upstairs became the, sen the Senate, replacing the House of Lords. And the, uh, this room, which had been designed as a lecture hall in 1893, became the uh, lower house. And they're still there a century later. Uh, the last great modern uh, building in the city was the General Post Office, which was probably the greatest work by uh, Francis Johnston from 1814. He had already designed the great Nelson Column uh, in 1808 that faces it. And of course that was blown up by uh, Republican uh, radicals in 1966. One of the jokes is that the, when the radicals blew up the column, uh, 
there was no damage in the rest of the town, but when the rest of the column was taken down by the government uh, engineers, it blew out every window on the street. And I'll come back to this street later. Uh, in another important event of the 18th century was in 1829, it was the so-called emancipation of Catholics. This meant that Catholics who had been denied most uh, civic uh, rights under the British were returned to full citizen status. So they could vote, they could own land, and the Catholics could also uh, buy land to build churches on, whereas before the churches had been uh, behind other buildings or in alleyways. And uh, one of the first buildings, even before the emancipation, was the pro-cathedral, which unfortunately had to be built on a minor street, uh, but it's still one of the best uh, neoclassical or gr uh, particularly Greek revival uh, buildings of that era. You can see the Doric, uh, Greek Doric columns that are used throughout this building. Um, and on, in 1829, three new Catholic churches were started the same year as the, uh, the emancipation. St. Nicholas, as you can see, was still in the location back from the main street, but uh, it's still a beautiful uh, neoclassical building. Um, St. Andrews is flush with the street, and but it's kind of disguised by the fact that it has a rectory and a nunnery on either side of it, so that it looks like part of a row. And uh, this is the interior there. And then the most impressive one, I think, is St. Paul's from 1837, which is right on the river, just a block down from the four courts. And so this told everybody that the Catholics were here to stay. And I showed before the Catholic uh, building for St. Audience, uh, which it, it took almost a century to complete. Even the railroad stations tended to use this neoclassical style. This is the Houston station, which has two of these towers. You can hardly see in the view on the left there, but there is a tower sticking out. And um, this is the Harcourt Street station. Uh, this is uh, the one Catholic uh, Gothic revival church that was really significant, designed by the son of uh, Augustus Welby Pugin, who really uh, popularized the use of Gothic architecture. And uh, then this is the university church, which was finished in the 1860s. And it was, uh, Newman wanted it to be just a plain box, but you can see they made it a very uh, eye-catching, uh, it's kind of uh, Byzantine interior design. Uh, the Victorian period was dominated by one architectural firm uh, founded by Thomas Dean, who you see here on the left, and his son, uh, Thomas Newnham Dean. Um, they designed the Natural History Museum in Oxford, which was one of the great buildings of England during this period. And their partner, uh, uh, Woodward here, uh, was often thought to be the real design genius, but they designed two important buildings for, uh, for Trinity. This was the old Trinity Museum, which had great carving and a spectacular staircase hall that runs the whole length of the interior of the building. And then uh, for the library, which is one of the most famous buildings in Dublin, they took the inside of an 18th century building, which was the largest one on the Trinity campus, and which originally looked like this, and they doubled the height of it and created what many people think is one of the greatest library interiors anywhere in Europe. Um, and then in the 1890s, the Royal Society uh, hired the grandson uh, uh, to design the uh, a whole complex of cultural buildings, the Natural History Museum, the uh, National Gallery, the National Library, and the Natu National Museum. And they're clustered around uh, 
Leinster House and what had been known as Leinster Lawn. And in this view, the Marion Square is off to the right in the distance. Here's the Natural History Building. They're all great examples of Victorian design. This is the uh, uh, art museum, which was expanded twice. And this is, are the two original rooms. The library with the reading room here and the uh, history building, which is now this is devoted mainly to archeological and medieval things, including all the great uh, br brass and gold things that have been found over the years. This is the lobby and this is the main exhibit hall. And you can see the uh, buttresses here are iron. And uh, Dublin was one of the early places where iron was used and introduced into formal buildings. Uh, one of the symbols of the city is the Haypenny Bridge, uh, which you see here crossing the Liffey. And uh, here's another view of it. The, there was a commission that commissioned this and they uh, offered the land at the far end of it to the merchants guild if they would build a tunnel through their building to let the pedestrians get through. And you can see it's still in use today. Um, the Glasnevin National Botanical Garden also has some great uh, greenhouses from the 1840s and 1880s. And our uh, current director of the Shaw's Garden was responsible for the restoration of uh, both of these uh, after they had become kind of a national scandal. This is one of the greatest with all these curved pieces of glass. And then this is the central hallway of the 1880s building. Um, the, in my, uh, April of 1916, there was an uprising called the, the Easter Rising that was an effort by the uh, Irish radicals to gain independence from England, but it failed. But the result of it was that this street, uh, Sackville Street, as it was known then, uh, was all, practically all the buildings were destroyed. And uh, this had been the most, uh, the widest and most impressive residential street in 18th century Great Britain. Uh, it now is called O'Connell Street after the man who got the legislation through for uh, the emancipation. Uh, uh, and you can see O'Connell's statue there uh, on the bridge, but this is what the street looked like after the Easter Rising. This is what the general post office looked like. It, the whole thing had been gutted. But uh, in the, in the, especially in the 20s, when the country became independent, it became an important for them to restore this street, O'Connell Street. And it still is one of the grand examples of that era. This is what the, uh, the main room of the library looks like now. And this is the uh, arcade that was added to the building in the back. And then these are some of the other buildings that were built along the street. Clary's was a department store, and this is based on a design by uh, Daniel Burnham that he designed for Selfridges in London and uh, the hotel, Gresham's Hotel and the theater. All of these buildings are, have been re-restored just in the last 10 years. Uh, and so that the street is looking better and better. Um, I'm jumping ahead to modernism. Uh, the, the bus station was really the first modern building built in Dublin, and it uh, attracted everybody's interest, uh, partly because the Department of Social Welfare was in the building, so it was a building of some presence, and a lot of people came and went there uh, in addition to the uh, bus riders, but it was designed by Michael Scott, who was just in his 20s at that time, and uh, he started a firm, which is still one of the major ones in Dublin. And these are the, uh, the murals, I mean, uh, mosaics that are on the undersides of the roof overhangs, both at the ground floor level and the upper levels. Um, 
in contrast to the bus station, this building uh, called Liberty Hall was not well received because it was the first high rise in the city and it seemed to ruin a lot of the vistas along the river, especially to the customs house. The name Liberty Hall seems odd, but this it replaced the former building of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, which had been bombed by the British in the 1916 uprising. And so the site was an important part of Irish history. And the new building was uh, actually commissioned by the same uh, union. And, and they're still there today. Now it's a landmark, of course, but uh, for many years after that, it kind of soured the taste of the Irish for modern buildings. And, uh, but the person who had the, the most deleterious effect was a man named Sam Stevenson. This man is the man who was his big uh, uh, enemy, uh, Desmond Guinness, who founded the Georgian Society when he heard that they, uh, the gas company was tearing down 16 houses of, from the Georgian era on Fitzwilliam Street to create a new office building that could have been anywhere. Uh, and this was a very bitter battle, which the preservationists lost. And this was built in its place. The brick that Sam Stevenson chose uh, didn't last and they'd had to be stuccoed over. But uh, just a few years ago, this was removed. And I'll show you the replacement later. Here's a view of Sam as he was at the time. His next uh, intrusion was the Central Bank of Ireland from 1978, which was violated the new height limitations. And when they told him this building is too high, he said, oh, I didn't bother to check. And so now that roof line is uh, intruding on many of the important views around the center of the city. Unfortunately, uh, they've moved out of, and all this is being renovated now too. Uh, and the last and most bitterly fought was Wood Key, which you see here in the left when it was just a row of Georgian houses uh, in, with the Christchurch Cathedral at the top of the hill. The new buildings turned the cathedral into a dwarf and that was the main reason why people were objecting to it. But also in the course of building the foundations, they discovered that all the archeological record of the uh, Gaelic and, uh, and Viking city were still underground here. Um, this model here on the right, notice it has the windows broken into three and most of the elevation of the four towers is windows. But by the time it was built, uh, Stevenson had changed his design so it looked like a concrete bunker. And uh, this really set off people. There was a demonstration here that drew 20,000 people. And as a result of this, the city fired him and hired uh, Scott Talon Walker to replace the, the uh, to build an atrium between these two towers and then to build a completely different building along the waterfront. It still blocks the view, but it's not as uh, outrageous as the other building would have been. The uh, modern architecture that people liked though, I'll just uh, show a few examples of this. The Berkeley Library from uh, on the, in the campus of, uh, of Trinity was uh, in addition to the old library that we saw earlier, and Paul Koralik, who was in his 20s, uh, made his name from this. Uh, and then they built this large arts building also, which created a new quadrangle. It's one of the busiest parts of the campus today. Uh, the American architect, uh, John Johansson, designed the U.S. Embassy, and this was obviously influenced by Oscar Niemeyer. Here's Johansson as he looked, and it's quite small uh, compared to the photos that you might have seen of this. You can see the uh, atrium in the center there. Uh, and uh, compared to his drawings, you can see that he modified it quite a bit uh, in the course of construction. It's still in great shape, as is this building, the Texaco House down the road, which is another example of the influence of 
Oscar Niemeyer, that kind of sculptural, uh, almost plastic look. And of course, Mies van der Rohe influenced uh, the uh, Scott Talon and Walker very much. This was the first Miesian building. And then they designed a whole complex of three buildings for the uh, Central Bank of Ireland when they moved out of the Parliament House. Uh, and they called this, when it was renovated, Miesian Plaza. I'll skip over this. Uh, just uh, two years ago, uh, an Irish architectural firm won the Pritzker Prize. And I didn't realize at the time it was two women. They go by the term Grafton Architects, which is just the name of the street where their office is. But uh, Shelley McNamara and Yvonne Farrell, they've now done buildings all over the world, but they did several uh, smaller buildings in Dublin, including this square, which has summer uh, awnings built over it. And this is what it looks like in the winter. Uh, with They designed these three buildings but a very a small scale. And this is the building they built to replace the gas company building that tore down the 16 Georgian houses. And uh, this is very much uh, uh, approved of by Dubliners. You can see the Mesian Plaza in the back of this picture behind these buildings. And the, here are some buildings that have been rehabbed using modern design. The Centenary Methodist Church uh, and two other churches. One is now a brewery and the other one is an office building. Uh, there are two bridges by uh, uh, Santiago Calatrava. The James Joyce Bridge from 2003, which is a, a automobile bridge. And I'll skip over this. And then the uh, the Samuel Beckett Bridge, which is near the mouth of the bridge and is intended to be a, a, a representation of the harp that's the symbol of Ireland that appeared on the British flag for many centuries. Uh, the Aviva Stadium is a, a, a great a, a football a pitch, a soccer pitch. And uh, this was one of the last buildings by Ronnie Talon of Scott Talon Walker. With the firm is still continuing though. And this is my favorite recent building they designed. This is the commission that's responsible for all the lighthouses around the shores of Ireland. And uh, it's built like a kind of squat lighthouse itself. And another building that's on a circle is the, uh, the Criminal Courts of Justice by Henry Lyons. Lyons actually died in 1947, but the firm is the largest one in Ireland today. And uh, it has won the Firm of the Year Award quite a few times. Uh, this is the uh, atrium of this courts building. So this theme of circular buildings continues. Uh, and this is a recent bank building they did with another spectacular atrium. Uh, Sheila O'Donnell and Thomas Twomey won the RIBA gold medal, which is another very exclusive architectural award. Uh, and this was their community center named for Sean O'Casey, which looks like some of the, uh, the uh, Japanese architects that we've seen recently. And then I'm gonna end with these two buildings, the convention center, which they specifically invited Kevin Roach to design. He of course was the uh, follower and uh, assistant of uh, Eero Saarinen and Roach and Dinklu, his subsequent firm uh, designed dozens of major buildings all over the world. But this is their convention center as it is in the daytime. It has this another uh, atrium with staircase going up like scissors and the auditorium is actually on the top. And this is the auditorium with the green chairs. And here's what it uh, looks like from the river at night. Notice the colors in the center one are the Irish flag, the green, white and yellow. And on the other side of the river directly opposite this is a whole complex of buildings uh, called the Great Canal Basin. And it is centered on their new theater, which is by Daniel Liebeskind. Uh, one of the few times Liebeskind has gotten his commission actually built. Um, it's now called the Board Gas Energy Theater from 2016. 
And you can see that part of the facade is just a sheet of glass leaning at an angle. Here's the cutaway section and you can see the auditorium, how it fits into the inside. And here it is, uh, these colors on the ceiling can be changed, uh, the lobby. And then this is the uh, square in front of the theater, which was designed by the American uh, landscape architect, Martha Schwartz. Uh, so if you go to Dublin, you're going to have a lot to look at. Uh, <laughs> and I, I could have done a whole other hour on some of the other buildings that are still in good shape or ones that are being renovated right now. Um, so I think we have five minutes left if somebody has a question. Uh, I don't know. You're going to read them or John? This is Trent. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, we just have a minute or two um, left before we have to finish up. But that was fascinating, Esley. Um, I, I, I guess I never realized there was that many buildings in Dublin. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And it's all in walking distance. You can tell from the, uh, the aerial photographs that it's a very walkable city. And the streetcar, uh, you can get a pass that you'd never have to buy another ticket, just get on and off. Wow, well, I'm gonna have to go there someday. Yeah, I really recommend it. The uh, airport is not far from the center of town either. I'm gonna get one question from Peter. How did you organize your trip tour ahead of time? Well, I'm sorry to say that it never occurred to me that I would get a talk out of this but the first time I went. So I had to go back in December to look at several other things. And I, I've been joking that I now probably have the largest art, uh, library of books about Dublin architecture in the state of Missouri, because I don't think any of the titles that I have are in the Mobius. The <laughs> I have a bibliography of about 70 books, which I'm going to post on our SAH website, along with the outline of this talk. Great, wonderful. Well, I think we'll wrap it up for this evening. Um, I want to thank Esley for the great talk. I want to thank John and I thank all of you for attending. Um, it was a wonderful talk. Um, please join us next month, um, April 25th. Andrew Hahn will be discussing the photos of Dr. William Spakoski, the dentist who became the pallbearer of old St. Louis. <laughs> you can all join us for that. So um, good night, everyone. Good night, Leslie. Good night, John. Thank you. <laughs>